In this module, we will move on to the orbital time scale changes, how the orbital parameters change and force changes in climate. In the tectonic section, I said you can decide on whether to include that as part of the whole climate change course or not. This section also has time scales that are obviously much longer than the global warming time scale that we will be dealing with. But if you see the feedbacks between various climate parameters and carbon dioxide, methane, greenhouse gases, then the sensitivity of our climate to changes in carbon dioxide are important because we want to understand how the past climate has responded to changes in carbon dioxide, whether they are forced by tectonic changes or by orbital forcing. So in that sense, especially for numerical models, computer models which are used to make global warming simulations or past climate simulations, we need to know whether the sensitivity of, let's say you change carbon dioxide by 10 ppm, how much temperature change is resulting from that when you include all the feedbacks from ice, temperature, humidity, vegetation and so on. So we need to have a sense of the climate sensitivity. So these examples of different time scales give us a good sense of the time scales that we are dealing with. So orbital time scales obviously comes from changes in the main orbital parameters as you know already from the basics. The earth is rotating around the sun uh, in an elliptic orbit. The ellipticity of the orbit itself changes on several time scales as we will see. The Earth's axis is tilted to the orbital plane at the current configuration it is 23.5 degrees that itself changes on several thousand time scales and the axis itself like a top it precesses and the orbit itself also precesses as we will see in more details. Uh, so the times or the distances from the sun when the solstices occur and the equinoxes occur themselves change over time. So uh, obliquity, ellipticity and precession together give us multiple time scales at which um, climate forcing is changed which means the amount of sunlight received or the way it is distributed seasonally over the hemispheres changes. And we know that the seasonality is related to the tilt of the earth. So if sun's rays are coming in parallel to earth, one hemisphere is pointing towards the sun in uh, one season. So Tropic of Cancer is facing the sun, then the northern hemisphere has summer, whereas the winter hemisphere is pointing towards the sun or we should not call it winter hemisphere. Northern hemisphere is referred to as the boreal summer boreal winter seasons. The southern seasons are referred to as austral summer and austral winter seasons. So when the northern hemisphere points away from the sun, the southern hemisphere has the summer. So we are out of phase in the two hemispheres. If there was no tilt, obviously there would be no seasons because as the earth would move around, all latitudes would see the same amount of sunlight throughout the year. So the orbital parameters, obliquity, precession and ellipticity and in the current configuration that is the tilt and the distance is slightly shorter to the perihelion in January compared to the distance uh, on in July to the aphelion. Aphelion and perihelion are just the minimum and maximum distance of the elliptic orbit around the sun. So which means in the winter season we are slightly closer so the winter is slightly milder for the northern hemisphere and summer we are slightly further away the summer is slightly milder uh, as well. And we have the equinoxes where the sun is over the equator and every latitude should have the same length of day and night but because of various factors like the uh, refraction of sunlight through the atmosphere and so on, actually daylight is not exactly 12 hours at uh, higher latitudes. Nonetheless, equinoxes are where the day and night are very close to uh, each other uh, in length, 12 hours. Okay? The other thing we will need to know for the orbital parameters is that you have three of them, three different time scales, but they can modulate each other. 
what do we mean by that? So if you think about a perfectly sinusoidal wave like this, the main parameters we think about are the wave period and the amplitude of the wave and the wavelength, right? These are the three parameters and of course, frequency is related to period by an inverse relation, one over period is just a uh, frequency. But this sinusoidal wave may be changing in amplitude uh, and frequency over time. You can see that here it is varying more slowly, the amplitude is higher than here for example. So, if there is a sine wave and some other wave is acting on top of it, that wave may modulate the amplitude, frequency and wavelength of this uh, particular wave we are looking at. So, uh, how will precession modify the ellipticity for example, okay? That will decide the combined time scales of the orbital forcing. We will see the example and it will become clearer. So, immediately you can see that this the obliquity change from 22 and a half degrees to 24 and a half degrees on 41,000 year time scale is not a perfect sinusoidal wave. There is an amplitude change and the frequency obviously remains almost the same, but you can see that over time going from 1.5 million years ago to the current time, the amplitude of the tilt is not changing uniformly, but it is kind of changing with periodicity of 41,000 years, but over different time scales the amplitude can be larger or smaller. These orbital calculations were done uh, by James Kroll and then Militin Milankovic in the 1800s and they, Milankovic specially said that the ice ages are uh, related to these orbital parameters and he set up all the mathematical calculations. So, that means we can also calculate the changes expected in these orbital parameters into the future. So, that is something that it is perfectly predictable. Okay. So, the effects of increased tilt then if you change the obliquity what happens? As you can imagine if you increase the tilt the hemisphere that is facing the sun will receive more energy during its summer and the hemisphere that is uh, facing away from the sun will be receiving even less energy during the winter. Because the distance is not changing the amount of sunlight per year will not really change but the seasons will become more extreme. So, the northern hemisphere uh, for example, will get stronger summer and winter, the southern hemisphere will get stronger winter and summer. So, the seasonal contrast will be increased. We will come back to how these things affect growth of glaciers and so on and so forth. Okay? So, the tilt changes the seasonality and it is out of phase in the sense that stronger summer here and stronger winter here and vice versa. So, you can call them in phase in fact. Okay? So, long term changes in eccentricity then is the next parameter. So, if it is an ellipse, if the ellipticity changes that it might become more circular or less circular, more elliptic. Okay? So, the change in the ellipticity is, is relatively small. It is only about maximum of 6 percent change. So, the distance from the sun changes in which case the radiation received in total over a year is going to be actually changed. If it is closer, more circular, you should get more energy per year. If it is more elliptic and away from the sun, then you will get less energy. So, unlike obliquity which just changes the seasonal distribution of radiation and not the total energy, ellipticity can change the total energy. But as I said, this ellipticity changes are relatively small. So, the radiative forcing associated with the ellipticity changes are relatively small. But again, you can see that there are two time scales here. One is around 400,000 years and another one around 100,000 years. So, again, these are modulated waves. They are not perfect sinusoidal waves. Their amplitude changes. In this case, even the periodicity changes. The third one is called precession and it has 
two components. One is the axial precession. So, because of the gravitational pull of the other planets within the solar system and the earth moon rotation, the moon's gravitationally trapped rotation of the earth as they go around the sun, they wobble together. All these factors together make the earth wobble around its axis like a top and that has uh, a time scale of about 26 thousand years and that is shown here more uh, clearly. If you see the axis, right now we are pointing towards uh, the north star Polaris about 13 uh, in 3000 BC, we were pointing towards something called Alpha Draconis and in about 13,000 years we will be pointing towards Vega to the north. Okay, so, as the precession uh, changes, where the north pole is pointing changes. Uh, the other component of the precession is the called the apsidal precession or the precession of the ellipse. Uh, because of the gravitational pull, essentially where in the orbit the sun, the given the tilt, the, the orbit uh, uh, itself keeps moving in such a way that where the equinoxes and solstices will happen itself changes. So, you can see this animation here as the earth is going around the sun, the orbit itself is moving. The distance at which the uh, equinoxes and solstices will happen itself will change and it is given in more detail here. So, right now uh, we have equinoxes in March and September and we have solstices in June and December. If the ellipse uh, keeps moving around, then you can see that you can move March and September equinoxes far away from the sun, whereas June and December can occur when they are closer to the sun, which means what? Basically, from today to 5750 years, the orbit will keep moving like this, the animation as the animation showed here. And if you do not change the calendar, obviously that is what will happen. So, as we keep moving in the orbit, uh, I am sure humanity will decide whether the calendar should be changed or not. So, 11,500 years from now, you will be back to completely flipping the December and January solstices. It, so, it will be farther from the sun during December's winter solstice and closer to the sun during the summer solstice, which means summer in the northern hemisphere will be harsher and uh, winter in the southern hemisphere will be harsher and so on and so forth. So, this is the two uh, precessions. One is the axial precession and the other one is the precession of the ellipse. Those are the two uh, time scales. So, here is the example of extreme solstice positions. You have uh, currently uh, December solstice here and the June solstice here and you can flip the uh, solstices and make it farther away. So, here June is at the aphelion, it means the uh, farthest position from the sun. December is closest to the sun in the perihelion. You can completely flip it and make it December at aphelion and June at the perihelion. These are natural processes. So, only question then is how do these changes affect the total energy received by the earth and what kind of internal feedbacks are then set up in terms of either growing of glaciers, melting of glaciers and then how does that change carbon dioxide, how does that change distribution of temperature and precipitation, how will that change vegetation distribution and how they will all feed back to the climate system and where the new climate system settles down. Okay. So, here is the example again of angular motion of the precession on uh, uh, 23,000 years, uh, fairly uniform. Eccentricity is changing on 100,000 year time scales and we, we showed that there are actually two time scales there, 400,000 and 100,000. So, there is a modulation of the uh, precession of the axis by the eccentricity by multiplying the two, you can see how that works. So, you have essentially an eccentricity modulated precession at 23,000 years and you can see that it is from being fairly uniform amplitude, it has now become modulated in amplitude. So, precession itself is not producing large radiation changes. 
it does produce some change because of the change in the distance from uh, the sun, but its impact mostly comes through its ability to modulate the axial precession. Okay? So, that is called the precession index. So, here is the precessional index producing multiple time scales 23,000 years, 400,000 years and 100,000 years. So, when you go and look at the past climate signals, we did not talk much about the change in time scales. So, we will come back to that when we looked at the 65 million year time scale. If you are careful or if you want to go and look at it again, you will see that there are times when the main oscillations are happening at 41,000 year time scale which is the obliquity time scale and in the last 2 million years the so called Pleistocene, the glaciations are happening at 100,000 year time scales and then there are times when there is more of a precessional time scale. So, we have to figure out what are the feedbacks within the system that amplify one time scale or the other. Somehow, the system is able to take the radiational forcing changes at these intrinsic time scales of the orbital parameters and internally amplify one time scale or the other. These details are not completely understood, but we will see that that also is probably related to the way uh, the orbital mechanics works. So, if you look at then the June and December insulation variations with latitude going from the equator to the northern pole and equator to the southern pole. The main thing to notice here is that if you look at June insulation changes or December insulation changes, obviously in June it is the northern hemisphere summer. So, you have higher amplitude changes in uh, radiation. The scale is here. This is about 30 watts per meter square. That is the amplitude here. So, you are talking about here from end to end about 30 watts per meter square which is fairly significant. How do we know that? Basically, you can compare it to the amplitude of the warming we are now producing because of the increase in carbon dioxide. So, how much response can be produced by 1 watt per meter square change at the net balance at the top of the atmosphere? That is what is critical. So, at higher latitudes, you will see that there is a uh, precessional time scale. As you come to lower latitudes, there is more of a obliquity time scales. So, as this caption here says, the presence of tilt changes are more obvious at higher latitudes and the precessional changes at low and mid latitudes are more prominent. That is the first thing. How does it work? Essentially, at low latitudes, the radiation changes will go into heating evaporation, convection, precipitation and so on. At higher latitudes, what do you expect? You expect that the change in energy will, let us say if already there is a glacier, if you change the energy at higher latitude, let us say at something like 65 north, the summer change in radiation, if you increase the radiation when there is a glacier, the glacier will melt, that will reduce the reflectivity, that will absorb more heat and that will melt more glacier. So, you will begin to have this kind of feedback. That is why the latitudinal changes in uh, forcing can be very critical. Ice albedo feedback is very critical feedback in both directions for building the glacier and for melting the glacier. How does it go for building the glacier? Let us say there is no glacier and then somehow radiation because of orbital forcing is reduced at some high latitude like 65 north. That means, you will begin to increase the glacier at higher latitude that will increase the reflectivity which means, it will get even colder. Then, you will get more glacier growth and further cooling and so on. Why is the summer insulation important? Basically, because if the snow does not melt in the summer, that means, more snow will fall on top of it in the winter and that can begin to accumulate. That is what gets compressed and that is what forms the glaciers. So, the summer insulation changes are typically important mostly because of the melting of the snow is prevented or enhanced in the summer months.
before the winter re emergence of snowfall uh, happens. So, these are the kind of details. There are many, many, many more details that we won't go into because once the glacier begins to melt, uh, if it slides uh, because as it is melting at the bottom there may be uh, because of the friction with the, the rocks and the ground on which it is sitting, there could be heating that melting may make it uh, like a lubrication. So, it might make the glacier move even faster on a mountain slope for example, that could accelerate the melting and the movement of the glacier towards lower latitudes where there is more radiation available and so on. So, these kind of processes are actually happening on uh, at in Antarctica for example, uh, in the current uh, global warming uh, simulation. So, lots of details like that you should just be aware that it is a very complicated process, but the feedbacks are basically started by a trigger that is provided by orbital changes and related radiation changes. So, here is the phasing of the insulation maxima and minima. If you change the tilt as I said, the radiation received will be maximum when the uh, when you if you increase the tilt, then the hemisphere that is facing the sun will get more radiation. This will be facing further away. So, it will get less radiation and similarly when this is facing away, it will get less radiation and this is now pointing more towards the sun because of the change in the tilt. So, it will get maximum radiation. So, the tilt causes in phase changes across the hemispheres, whereas when you change precession, you are essentially changing the distance from the sun at which the solstices are happening. So, perihelion and aphelion are flipped. For example, let us say uh, instead of having summer at the aphelion as we are having now, if we have the summer during a perihelion, then this amount of energy received is increased at all latitudes. So, both hemispheres are receiving maximum radiation during the perihelion and on the other hand in the aphelion, both are further away. So, both are receiving less radiation. So, you will get out of phase changes between the summer and winter seasons. Those things again matter. So, the complications from overlapping uh, cycles as I said produces time scales that are hard to interpret. So, in the past you will go and take an ice core or a sediment core and you will find that there is some period of oscillation and then if you want to figure out which orbital parameter produced it, then it is not going to be easy because of these overlaps. So, you have the 100,000 year ellipticity cycle, 41,000 year obliquity cycle and the 23,000 year precession cycle, but you can combine any two of those or all three of them and produce very different time scales. Plus, we will see that the thermal inertia in the system of the ocean and the glaciers makes even more time scales because they do not immediately respond at these time scales. There will be a delay in the glacier response, there will be a delay in the ocean response and so on. So, additional complications come because of the forcing at these combined time scales. So, mathematically these are very easy to predict and you can see that overlapping time scales can be looked at, but when you include all the feedbacks in the system, it is not always clear what emerges. If that is not enough, then we have an additional factor. As continents move, the moon earth distance can change and the gravitational pull and the tidal forcing can change. So, earth itself can change its rotation rate and so on. So, if you look at the change in precession cycle, it used to be 20,000 years and now it is at 23,000 years. The obliquity change used to happen around 30,000 years, now it is around 41,000 years over this earth's evolution time scale of 4.5 billion years. Essentially, that is because of these tectonics movements. Okay? That happens even now during an El Nino when large amounts of water move back and forth or because of the atmospheric tides and so on, the air masses and the water masses get moved around, then the mass redistribution makes the earth wobble 
and the length of day changes by a little little bit, few microseconds and so on. So it's a very dynamic system. So there is a feedback between a mass distribution either because of tectonics or because of the climate itself uh, and that can on long time scales uh, feed back to the orbital parameters. Okay? So the other thing that I must mention are the rule, the laws of orbit of the earth around the sun or any planet around a parent star. So the first law says the orbit of each planet is an ellipse with sun at one focus. This is very basic. The second law is a bit more interesting because it does affect the time scales that emerge in the climate system. The second law says a line joining a planet to the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal times. I will show a figure that will make it uh, clear. The third one is not so important. The square of a planet's orbital period is proportional to the cube of its semi-major axis. But the second one, it is essentially saying that equal amount of area has to be covered in equal amount of time. So because of gravity, when the planet is going around here closer to the sun, it is being flung around faster. It is moving faster here because of the gravitational pull and it is moving slower here. What does that mean? That means here you are covering the same area, you are right. You can see the, the delta t here and t delta t here, the time over which these areas are covered are very different, which means you are closer to the sun here, summers are stronger but you are moving away faster. So you are receiving more energy, the summer is shorter. Here you are far away and moving slower, so the summer is weaker but the summer is longer. And it turns out that for glaciation, the total amount of energy received in the summer is what matters, not just the intensity. Okay? Which means even if you are closer to the sun because you are moving faster, you might end up glaciating because you are receiving totally less energy because the summer is shorter. Whereas here you are far away, less intensity, but when integrated over the summer, the total energy is, is larger. So these are the things that one has to worry about when we do these orbital forcing calculations and mostly for interpreting past records. What are the time scales that are buried in the, the past paleoclimate records in temperature, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, glacial volume, etc. And what orbital process was responsible for producing it? What are the internal feedbacks that uh, produced it? So let us look at application to a particular phenomenon that is of more interest to us here in, in India or in Africa where there are monsoonal circulations. We briefly mentioned monsoonal circulations when we were doing climate introduction, introduction to climate science. Essentially the heat capacity of the ocean is much higher than that of land. So if you have sun moving from over the ocean to on uh, land as it happens from March, April, May into June, July, August, sun is coming from the southern hemisphere into the northern hemisphere. Uh, the Asian land mass in India, they are getting heated up the heat faster than the Indian Ocean because the heat capacity is low. When temperature is high, pressure is low. So the relatively speaking, the ocean is cooler than land, so the pressure is high. Wind wants to go from the high pressure to low pressure. Remember we have to add Coriolis. Again we will see the horizontal map of winds which will make it clearer. So as the winds come with evaporated water vapor onto land, and the air rises, let us say by hitting the western Ghats or the Himalayas, the air condenses and there is rainfall. In the winter on the other hand, the sun is moving back onto the ocean. So you have more heating of the ocean, so lower pressure. Land also cools faster because now the sun's heating is reduced. So you get colder temperatures, high pressure, so now you are blowing the winds from land onto the ocean. So during the northeast monsoon, December, October, November, December, we have winds coming from the north. So places like Chennai get more rain in the winter than in the summer. So how does this get affected by orbital forcing? 
John Kutzbach from University of Wisconsin was the first one to argue that there is a orbital forcing of the monsoon and it's been now tested again and again and it turns out that he was absolutely right. There is an orbital signature in monsoon variability on long time scales. So here are the major monsoon systems. There are some weak monsoons and there are some strong monsoons. Monsoon, to remind you, is the word that comes from mausam in uh, Arabic or Persian, which means season. They noticed that the winds change seasonally, so they called it mausam or monsoon. And there are regions where the winds do change directions, but here the contrast is much, much weaker. So the so-called North American monsoon and South, uh, Central American monsoon, South American monsoon, they are relatively weak. So usually when we say monsoon, everybody obviously thinks of the Indian monsoon because it's the most dramatic one. Even Australia has a reversing land to ocean, ocean to land. Circulation change seasonally, but that's also uh, fairly weak, okay? So very simply, if you have winter to summer to winter radiation cycle that looks like this, let's say this is our modern seasonal cycle of radiation forcing and some orbital change happens like a tilt change which would make the summer stronger and the winter weaker. That would essentially increase the contrast between the land and the ocean because of the increased radiation. So the land would heat even more than in the control case or the compared to the modern uh, radiation and the ocean would heat more, but this contrast would increase because of the heat capacity and you expect a stronger summer monsoon. And the same thing will then produce a stronger winter monsoon because you have more cooling of the land in the winter and there is more cooling of the ocean, but because of the heat capacity again, the contrast increases and you have a stronger winter monsoon. So radiation can directly force monsoon changes as long as the continents remain the same on the time scales in which the orbital forcing or the obliquity is changing and we know that that's the case. Indian monsoon has been there for 10 million years but these orbital changes are happening on at the most 400,000 years. So you have many changes recorded in the monsoons that are correspond to orbital forcing. So the June insulation is shown here as the threshold value, which means if the contrast of land and ocean heating is not strong enough, then you don't get a very good monsoon. But once the radiative heating is strong enough, the June insulation is strong enough at a critical latitude like 30 north, then the ocean land contrast became becomes strong enough that you set up a real strong monsoonal circulation. So the modern insulation is let's say here and in the past insulation has changed in this way uh, because of again the combination of obliquity, precession and ellipticity and you have had monsoons that have been weaker than normal and stronger than normal, okay? So how are these recorded? Basically every t monsoon means rain rain means more vegetation or less vegetation, more river flow or less river flow. So rivers bring in the organic matter and the weathered material and various um, elements like titanium, neodymium and so on and so forth and organic matter uh, which has polymers like alkenones and so on. So if you have a lot of rain for example, a lot of organic matter comes in because a lot of rain also produces rich forests and that organic matter gets buried because the, the river flow is so strong that it keeps putting more organic matter on top. Anytime, anywhere there is organic matter or hydrocarbons available, there will be either bacteria or animals or somebody who is going to utilize it and eat it. But if you put more and more on top of each other, then there will be oxygen depletion, so that organic matter will not be consumed. So that leaves certain types of organic signatures that can be used to look at the variations in monsoon in the past. 
There are also uh, river flow related chemical tracers as I said, uh, which are also used for inferring changes. So, here is an example, the Mediterranean circulation right now, let us say the Nile river is bringing runoff into the Mediterranean. There have been a lot of issues, a lot of dams built on the Nile, Nile delta used to be very rich just like the Ganga Brahmaputra delta, but because of human activities, dams, etcetera, it is been degrading, etcetera, etcetera. But here just schematically, if the Nile river is weak because the African monsoon is weak, let us say African monsoon actually does not reach that far, but there is monsoonal circulation over parts of the Mediterranean. And that would bring in the Atlantic water, create deeper Mediterranean water, which is mixing up the surface waters with deeper waters. Remember atmosphere has lot of oxygen, so the near surface water has lots of oxygen that will go to the bottom and the deeper water will be oxygen rich. So, the sediment will be respired by the bacteria that are living there. As long as there is oxygen, there are bacteria that are using up the organic matter that is coming from the Nile river, let us say. But if the monsoon or the rainfall gets very strong, then the Nile river runoff gets very strong. So, the salinity decreases near the surface because the river water has much less salt than the ocean water. So, that puts a cap, a fresh water cap on top of the Mediterranean, which makes it harder for the Atlantic water to bring in oxygen, because the oxygen link has been removed to the deeper water. So, the deeper waters begin to become depleted in oxygen, which means the respiration of the black muds begins to decrease. So, the organic material in the black muds begin to increase, whereas here you will get more normal deep ocean sediments, which have been respired by the bacteria, aerobic bacteria. Okay? So, this is called sometimes the stinky mud of the Nile. So, you can see the signatures of banded sediments, dark black mud when the rainfall is high, lighter normal mud when the rainfall is low and so on and so forth. So, we will stop here and I will just recap that we looked at orbital forcing. We said there is the obliquity change 22 and a half to 24 and a half degrees over 41,000 year time scale. The amplitude as we saw is not uniform. There is the ellipticity change happens on 100,000 and 400,000 year time scales and there is a precession change that happens on the axial precession and the apsidal or the precession of the ellipse that happens on 19,000 to 26,000 years on average 23,000 years. The complications are that the uh, precession can modulate, ellipticity can modulate the precession and the obliquity and precession can overlap, um, ellipticity and obliquity can overlap and so on. So, you end up with multiple time scales and then there are feedbacks we will see more of them within the system where the time scales are generated by internal feedbacks given the changes in the orbital forcing. Okay? And the other example we saw was of course, um, where the radiation change is important. So, high latitude radiation changes have tilt signal and the low latitude and mid latitude uh, signals have more of a precession signal. and radiation change at something like 65 north in the summer season can be critical, because it can initiate the melting of the glacier or building of the glacier, which can give you this ice albedo feedback. And the critical thing we will see later on that the ice albedo feedback is not symmetric. When you are building glacier, it goes much more slowly than when you are melting the glacier. This is very critical because in global warming, we are melting many glaciers. So, if glacier melting can go very fast because of the ice albedo feedback, then we have to be careful what we are doing to the glaciers over Greenland and Antarctica and so on. So, again orbital forcing, we can predict what is coming next in the next few thousand years and so on. So, it is not happening in the global warming time scale of a couple of hundred years, but the feedbacks that we see are very critical.
So, we will show that there are also chemical signatures, greenhouse gas change signatures like CO2, methane, N2O, which means these feedbacks in the climate are critical to be understood so that we know how sensitive our climate system is to perturbations in greenhouse gases. What has happened in the past tells us a lot about how our climate may behave in the future, even though the perturbations may come from human activities rather than orbital changes. So, we will continue this in the next lecture. See you next time.